Welcome back. Today we're going to look at program flow control statements, uh, some common errors, um, reading numbers and strings in the vector class, and how to generate random numbers. So in addition to um, you know our if statements and other and switch statements and other ways to uh, change the flow of our program, we also have the uh, ability to use uh, certain types of jump statements. And they include break, continue, return, and go to. You've already used uh, the break statement in the switch um, statement. And basically what it does is it, uh, if you're in some kind of um, a, a loop or uh, a conditional, it'll break out of that and, um, and continue executing with the statements after it. The return statement you've used before, we're going to see more of it in uh, the when we go over functions. You've used it uh, when you declared main. Uh, the go to statement is one that uh, where you can put a, a label somewhere in your program and it'll go directly to that location. We highly recommend not to use go to. Um, it creates something called spaghetti code, and uh, generally speaking you should never have a reason to use go to. The break statement um, is often used in your switch statement and it's it terminates a condition and then causes execution to resume after the entire switch statement. In a loop, if you use a break statement, what will happen is the, uh, the entire loop will stop and it's often used uh, when you reach a, a condition where you found maybe what you're looking for during a search and you don't want to do the rest of the loop because you've already found it and so you you can use a break there as well so um, right so let's take a look at this question um, pause the video uh, come up with the answer and then uh, hit continue so write the code that will find the first number less than 100 that is divisible by 13 and use a break statement to prevent unnecessary execution. So we want to find the first number less than 100 that's divisible by 13. So we're going to need a loop. And we want less than 100. And um, so plus plus i. And one of the things we're going to have to do is, since we need, we're going to need to be able to see this, see i after the loop is done. And if we were to declare our variable i here inside the loop, what would happen is it would be only in scope within this loop. In order to be able to see the value of i afterwards, you need to declare the variable out here. And the condition we're looking for is if i divided by 13 um, is div if if i is div divisible by 13, which really means if the remainder is zero. So if we say i mod 13 equals 0, that will tell us if that number is divisible by 0. And actually, we want to find the first number less than 100 that is divisible. So our loop actually can't be this way. It has to go backwards. So we have to go from 0 to i is greater than, from 100 to i is greater than 0. And so this is a backwards loop. And if i mod 13 is equal to 0, it means it's evenly divisible. And what we would do then is use a break statement. And if we break here, then 
what will happen is this will keep going through the loop until this if statement returns zero or this or it returns true and so it'll just keep going through and then eventually we'll find a number that is divisible by 13 and it'll break at this point you, you know you could output uh, the result So that should be our code. The continue statement uh, is used in loops and it forces the next iteration of the loop to occur. When the program reaches a continue statement, basically what it does is it will stop the current iteration of the loop and then it will continue on to the next iteration of the loop. So it doesn't completely halt the loop. If we look at this example, if we look at this example, we can see that we have a, a while loop and it has a number and a count, and we want 10 valid numbers. So in this case, <clears throat> in order to force the user to provide a valid number, what they've done is uh, they've done a CN statement to get the number, and then they check to see if the number is outside of the range. So if it's less than 1,000 or greater than 4,000, then uh, it gives the user a, a message saying not the correct range, and then it does a continue. What this continue will do is it'll skip all the remaining steps in this loop and continue back to the beginning of this while. And so this while will keep running through until the user enters a value that is in the correct range. When it's in the correct range, the, this if statement will be um, will be false because the if statement is checking for numbers that are outside the range, and then and then execution will go down. The count will be incremented, and it says, "Good job, you're in the right range." And it'll continue on. And because this count keeps running until it gets a 10, this forces the user to enter 10 valid numbers. So let's write the code that will find all the numbers less than 100 that are not divisible by three and use a continue statement. Pause the video, try to write down your answer, and then hit continue. So let's see, we want to find all the numbers less than 100 that are not divisible by three. So we're going to need a loop. And since we want all the numbers, we can actually start from 0 and go until i is less than 100. And then And so we're going to, so we want to see if all the numbers less than 100 that are not divisible by 3. So we're going to check to see if i mod 3 equals 0. That means it is divisible by 3. We don't want, if it's divisible by 3, we, won't, we don't want to, to include it. And so what we'll do is, if it's divisible by 3, we'll u do a continue. And what this will do is it will, if this condition occurs, if it's divisible by three, then it'll just go back to the beginning of the loop. If it's not, for now we'll just see out. Then we'll see out the number. Running this loop 
what will happen is, is for example, start off at zero. Is zero to mod three equals zero? Yes, it'll continue. One mod three is one, so this will be false. It won't continue, it'll output one. Then it'll come around and it'll just keep going through and uh, finding whether or not, and finding all the numbers that, and it'll skip all the ones that are divisible by three. So some common errors. <clears throat> the first mistake uh, that often can be done is we can have uh, a counter that is, uh, someone is setting up a counter and in this, or the first mistake that happens with conditionals is this. You, ha you have to have, on the either side of a logical statement, you have to have full logical expression. So here, we, this part counter less than five works, but just putting a less than 10 on the right side doesn't work. C++ will not assume that counter belongs here. So you have to have counter less than five and counter less than 10 for that to work. This one will not work. This format will. Another common mistake with uh, your logical expressions is forgetting to put the double equal sign. Remember, this is an assignment operation. If you sign B into A, what's going to be evaluated will be B. So if B is 0, that would be interpreted as false. And if B is 1, that would be interpreted as true. To do an actual equivalence check, you have to use the double equals. Uh, another error that can occur is if you're comparing uh, floats versus doubles, uh, often you can get very, very small, um, in the process of doing subtractions and divisions and calculations, sometimes your floating point variables may not be exactly equal to zero. So rather than comparing a uh, float to the value zero, it's often a good time, a good idea to just see if the float is less than a very small number, like 0 0.001. Semicolon and braces. One of the most common errors when a programmer is first starting is when they write a statement which uh, involves a block of code. For example, this while loop. It also happens with if statements. If you put a semicolon after the the first expression here, the semicolon actually terminates this while and this it disconnects it from its this block of code. So this block of code has nothing to do with a while because of the semicolon. So if your loop or your if statement is just is not working or is just running continuously, and this will actually cause an infinite loop, um, look for a semicolon that's uh, between a statement and its block of code. Uh, so occasionally you have uh, misplaced else's or an illegal else or if you get an unexpected end of file message often what it is is the way you have an else statement that isn't fully resolved or you have uh, some curly braces which aren't aren't set properly and you'll get unexpected end of file because the program for example gets one opening curly brace but can't find the closing one before the before the it finishes compiling that that uh, file. And so you'll see errors like illegal else without matching if, unexpected end of file found. If you ever see those, it's probably because you started a statement and didn't finish it, or you started a curly brace and did not finish the curly brace. So let's look at reading numbers and strings. Um, there's, you can often use CN and get line to do to get strings. However, note that the CN function ignores all your leading white space characters, and it, it, and CN will read until it sees the first space and leaves the, reads the first space. And what it will do is when it does that, it will leave the enter key in the keyboard queue. 
the get line function reads everything including the uh, the enter key. So if you're going to read one wor word out of uh, the input stream, i.e. the keyboard, then CN works well. If you're going to want to get entire line, you're going to use get line. However, because CN leaves the enter key in the keyboard queue, if you do a CN and you get one word and then you do a get line, often what happens is the get line just gets skipped because since that enter key is in the keyboard queue, um, the, uh, the program will just take that enter key and use it to uh, complete the get line. And so if we have a program that reads numbers with CN and strings with get line, we have to be careful that uh, we don't let leave that enter key that's left in by the CN to be read by the get line. Otherwise, and the way what you'll see is you'll be running your program and get line will your get lines will just get ignored. So let's look, take a look at this program. We have C out, enter a number, and we're in, CN, we're doing a CN into number. Then we do a C out, enter color, and we do a get line. When we when this line executes, and the, let's say the user types in 42, and then and then a carriage return. After that carriage return, the CN gets executed, the 42 gets placed into number, but this carriage return stays in the keyboard buffer. When we get to the get line, since there's a carriage return in the keyboard buffer, it just immediately executes the get line, color gets an empty string, and the whole statement is ignored. In order to fix that, we have to use something called CN.ignore. So as a rule, after you do a CN, you can do a series of CNs, but after the last one in that area of code, you want to immediately do a CN.ignore. This consumes that excess enter key and ensures that this situation uh, doesn't create a problem. So always remember, after you do a series of CNs, always do a CN.ignore. Let's look at the vector class. So the vector, let's say we want to store a, a series of numbers and, uh, and we don't want to write a separate variable for each individual number. We can use the vector class to store a collection of, of values and, uh, and they can be used for numbers or strings, but a vector stores a collection of all of one type of variable. The vector class has the, these methods that work with it called pushback, size, and at. The pushback function will push data on the end of the vector. The size function tells us how many data items are being are held in the vector object. And the at function, if you pass an integer to the at function, it uh, returns the item at that element. So for example, here we have, now, the other thing is, is to use the vector class, you have to have an include statement that says include vector. That brings in the vector library. You can then declare a vector by saying vector, and then between these angle braces, you put the type that you want this vector to store. And then, of course, an identifier. So it looks like your other variable declaration names, except for these angle braces, which identify what type of thing you want your vector to store. Once you've declared your vector, you can then use the vector's pushback method in, or function in order to push values onto it. In this case, this is a vector of ints. And notice that to call the pushback function with a, the vector class, you put the name of the vector, which is vnums, and you have to put a dot operator. So you put a dot here, and then you put the name of this pushback function. The reason for that is pushback is a function that belongs to this vector class, and it can only be used on things that are vectors. So we have the dot operator uh, in order to do that, and you have to use these function calls have to be used the dot operator with a, a variable of the type of that class. With pushback, if you then put in a value that has to be of this type, int. So if it was a float, it'd have to have a decimal point with an F. And if it was a string, it would have to have the double quotes and be a string. 
but once you put the value in, this will add 35 to the vector. The next line will add 99 to the vector. The next line will add 27. And so you'll get a vector that's holding actually three values. So one variable holding three, in this case, three values. And so you can keep pushbacking values onto your vector as many as you want. The next line of this code, then uh, you, know, you can use the size function to get the size method to get back how many items are in the vector. In this case, it would say three. And then if you want to go through and just, you know, and access all the elements in the vector, that size function actually com becomes very uh, important because it allows us to loop through, it, gives, it tells us how many elements we need to loop through the vector in order to look at them all. And you notice that the for loop that we learned works very well for going through collections. We start with uh, the first index. Remember that the other thing about vectors is the first element is at the zero index, not the one, but the zero index. So we say that vectors are zero based. And most collections in programming are going to be zero based, where the first element is zero. It will go all the way up to I less than the size, and that makes sense. If there's three elements, the indices are 0, 1, and 2, so you'd want I to go from 0 to 2, not 0 to 3. So you don't want an equal sign here. You want I less than the size. It then increments and just keeps looping through, so initially we would have the vector at 0, which would be at 35, then the vector at 1, which would be the 99, and then the vector at 2, index 2, which would be the 27, because it's 0, 1, 2. And then it, when, it, when we increment to 3, uh, 3 is less than size, which is not less than size, which would be 3. That would fail, and we would continue on. So this will loop through and show all the elements. And so... If you ran that, you would get 35, 99, and 27. There are several functions available for the vector class. There's the at function we saw, the pushback. There's also a popback function, which removes the last element of the vector. And the an empty which uh, function, which returns true if the vector is empty, and a clear, which will remove all the elements of the vector. And of course, we saw the size, which returns the number of elements in the vector. Let's look at random number generation. So often it's useful to be able to generate random numbers in programming. It's used for game development. It's used for simulations uh, and uh, a number of other uh, functions. The uh, C++ random number, gener number, ge random number generator function is called RAND. And it has a seed function called srand. And uh, the random function returns a number between 0 and 32,767, which has a, a global constant called max rand. So if you look at, if you were to, if you didn't want to type out 32,767, you could just say see out rand, max rand, and it would return that number. Or if you need to compare a number against max rand, you could use max rand to do that. RAND returns only integers. And SRAND is a function that uh, accepts an integer as a seed or starting point for an algorithm. So um, often we'll use the system time to do that. So here's an example of a program that uses random. And there's two libraries that are primarily associated with um, RAND, which is the the uh, random library, which is embedded in, uh, I believe, in this uh, CST li library, you can also use random, and then the CTime library. So, here, once you have those libraries included, what they're doing here is they're creating a seed, uh, a number, and an I, and an answer. And so to generate random numbers, the first thing we want to do is seed the random number generator. 
And what this code is doing here is it's taking the SRAN function from this library and then calling the time function, which is actually coming from the C time library. And if you pass null to the time function, what it does is it returns this, the current system clock as an integer number. It, in this case, and in this case, SRAND takes an unsigned int as its, uh, as its parameter. So we take the time, the results from the time function, turn it into an unsigned int with this code here, and that will seed our random number generator. If you don't have this statement, you'll get a pseudo number, a pseudo random sequence uh, from random, and which is a, which, may, which, will, which while it'll be a random sequence, it will always be the same sequence. So we have to seed our random number generator to make sure that it, it, we get a different sequence of random numbers each time. We then have a loop, and by saying number equals rand, this program will then get the next random number in a sequence, place it in a number, and then here they're displaying it. The set W, of course, just makes sure that it uses eight characters to display the number. So this will generate eight random numbers. And uh, let's run it. We'll see. The, we'll look at the first part. So I'll hit Control F5 to run the program. And we can see that this function that's displaying eight numbers across, these are all the random numbers that are generated. And they're numbers between 0 and, and, and 27,000, approximately. Let's run it again. And every time we run this program, you'll see that we get different random numbers. That, uh, that appear. The next part of this program asks you to enter a seed value. And instead of seeding it off the time like it did here, it'll take that seed value that you provided and it's going to generate eight random numbers. And what we're going to see is if we have the same seed value then it will get the same results. So let's run this again. I'm going to start without debugging again. And so if I enter a seed value of 8, for example, I'll get that. Let's do another one, hit 8 again. And you notice if you have the same seed value, you get the same values. They're, they're random in the sense that they're, they're, the algorithm is called a pseudo-random function that creates a, a very variable sequence of numbers. But if we start with the same seed, we get the same sequence of numbers. If I put in a different sequence, a different uh, seed, we notice that we get a different sequence of random numbers. And you notice that you know the differences between each of these is different from the 8 to the 4, but, um, but if we keep the same seed, it'll actually end up with the same sequence. So the, uh, the thing with um, random number generation is that it's actually not possible for a computer to truly create random numbers. We have to use a seed value. And the reason we often use the system time is it's very unlikely that the same computer will be started at the same time. And therefore, this time value really makes it about as random as we can get it. And that was program 316. You can 
on uh, Blackboard, you can find the example codes. Depending on when you take this course, it'll show up in something that looks like a um, book example code. And if you go there, you'll find that each chapter's sample code will be there. You can download it and, and look at that, that sample code and run it. Now, having a value between 0 and 32,000 is nice, but often that's not what we're looking for. So we need to figure out how to modify RAND so that it returns the, the values we want. And the way we do that is with the modulus operator. Remember that the modulus operator is basically the remainder. So if I take the modulus of, if we wanted, for example, to a number between 0 and 10, we could take whatever number RAND gives us, take the modulus of 11, and what that will return is a number at most between 0 and 10. For example, if we if the random returned 11, 11 mod 11, so if we had 11 divided by 11, actually let's do modulus 11, that would be That would return, this arrow isn't very good looking. Okay, let's make that a little better. There we go. 11 mod 11 would return zero because 11 goes to 11 one time and it has zero remainder. So that would be the lowest value. If you, if uh, let's say Rand returned 10, then 10 goes into 11 zero times with 10 remainder, that would, re that would return 10. So no matter what number you put in and take the modulus of, it can, no it can never be any smaller than zero and it can never be any larger than 10. So by taking the modulus of a random number, we can use that number to limit the range. Let's say we wanted one to 10. Well, in that case, we need 10 separate values. And to get 10 separate values, you take the modulus of the number of different values you want, which is 10. That will return this first part would return between 0 and 9. And to get 1 to 10, you would add 1. So 0 plus 1 would be 1, and 9 plus 1 would be 10. So when you add this plus 1 part to that, that's where you get the 1 through 10. So the way I think about it is this. I, you know, If we want from minus 25 to 25, how many different numbers is that? Well, there's 25 on the left side of the 0. There's 25 on the right side, so that's 50. But then we also have to include 0. So that's 51 different values. So we put 51 here. And then to shift, and that would give us 0 to 50. And to shift 0 to 50 to minus 25 to 25, just look at the 0. How I need to subtract 25 to make that a minus 25, and that would get me my minus 25 to 25. Let's do this so it doesn't look like minuses. So to get to 0 to 50, I to get to minus 25 to 25, I, I take the mod of the number of values I want, so 51, because we have to include the 0, and then subtract from that to shift the result from 0 to 50 to minus 25. 25 requires a minus 25. If you wanted to do uh, floating point numbers, what you could do is you could realize how many different values are between zero, all three, to one point zero 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 in point one increments. Well, that's a thousand numbers 
or a, that's a thousand and one different different values because there's all the increments going up to one and then we include the zero if you include the zero then that's one more so that's well it's actually ten thousand different values and then so you would do this random portion first to get the integer value and then you would divide by a floating point number or double in this case we do we notice this point here we're making a double so we'll divide this integer by a double to get the the, the decimal portion so let's look at a few programs so again we're including the CSTD library to get the uh, srand and rand we could also just include the random library to do the same thing and then we have the time library and again here we have this statement that seeds random no, number random so that it will be different each time so you always want that typically at the beginning of your program if you're using rand and then uh, in the first section here what happens is we have a loop that's going to do 10 iterations and notice that we're using the modulus operator so if if it's just the modulus 7, that will give us a value between 0 and 6. Realize, if you divide by 7, you can never get 7 as a remainder. So whatever this number is, 1 less than that is the, is the top end value, and the bottom one is 0. And then it's going to display that. I'll run that just to see. We're just going to look at the top part of this program. And we can see we have all these random numbers and... The, the max value that you get is 6, the lowest value you get is 0. If I run it again, you can see I get another sequence of numbers. Again, the same limits. We didn't get a 0 and a 6 this time, but we can see that we get a different sequence of numbers. So the, the seeding function is obviously working, and this will, is returning random numbers between 0 and 6. The next part of the program, we have a loop, and you can see that they're they're taking they're getting a random sequence between zero and one thousand up here, and then in order to convert that into a nice um, floating point number or double, they've declared random as double. What they're doing is they're dividing by a thousand point zero to um, to make it a floating point number so we can get random floating point numbers and that's what you get here you can see we get a bunch of random numbers and they're floating point numbers so even though the rand function only returns an int you can use this strategy to get a floating point number or double the next part of the loop basically is return us a number between 0 and 50 and then we're using the 25 to shift it. So the, in order to get between my, a my negative number and a positive number, first say how many different values are we going to get? 25, 25, that's 50 different values. And then we add 0, that's 51 different values. So this code will get us those 51 different values between 0 and 50. And then we have to shift this to get it between minus 25 and 25. And we do that by just subtracting 25. And that's what we're getting here. We can see we're getting negative numbers between positive 25 and negative 25. Another way of writing this, it's a little more succinct, is you can just do this all in one line rather than doing it in two steps, and it will get you the same results. So that's uh, listing 317. Take a look at it and uh, play with it. Let's look at another program. So this is th program 318. 
And here we're declaring a couple of vectors. So we have vectors of names and vectors of oranges. And notice that we're using the pushback function to push values onto these vectors. So we have two variables, but they're going to hold multiple values. Names will eventually have Barbara, Kelly, Claire, and Janice. Um, origins uh, have you know have Greek, Celtic, French, English, and Celtic. And so we have all these names and the origin of the the name from um, the language and then its meaning in that language. And so once we have these two vectors and they're loaded, and that's normally the pattern. You declare your vectors, then you use pushbacks, a series of pushback statements to put values onto that vector. How do we use it? Well, here we have a, a program which asks the user to enter a name. And then, uh, and then in this case, we have a Boolean variable that says, and often we will our Boolean variables put a B to designate that it's a Boolean. And then we have a logical, uh, you know, the, the, the name of it kind of suggests its logical purpose. So B did not find it. And we set, we can initialize, in this case, we're initializing this, this flag to true. And so what we're doing is we're going through and saying, while we're, and we want to search those vectors to see if the, the name is in there. And the way we can use this flag is we can say, while well, the index is less than the name size, so as long as we're still going through the list of names, we'll keep going through this loop. And if we didn't, we can check to see if we found it or didn't find it. So if we haven't found it yet, which it starts off as true, this expression will let the loop keep running. As soon as we find it, by using this flag this way, this will become false no matter where we are here, and this will cause this loop to break out. So this is, we could use a break probably to do this, but another way of doing that is using a flag. And so this code will keep running through until it finds what, the name, and then it'll break out. And if, the username that the person typed in is equal to, and notice we're using the at method. So by using the at method and passing in the current index of what we want to look at to see if we found it, if the username matches you know, the name that's being placed in, then what will happen is this will return true Will out, it'll output, here's your name, and I'll put the name using, again, the at and then the index. And then, because these two vectors are parallel, that is to say that the zeroth index and the names vector corresponds with the zeroth index with the origins vector, and the first element of the names vector corresponds with the first element of the origins vector, and vice versa, all the way down then we can say, if we have the index of the name, then we can use that index to find the origin. It's kind of a way of programmatically structuring a table. And this will then display the origin. The next thing it does is sets uh, did not find it to false, because we did find it, the opposite of did, and so we set that to false, and it comes back around, and since that this right side of the the and operation returns false, then it will cause this whole expression to to return false, and then while will continue on. If we don't find the name inside the the, the that partic a particular iteration, what it does is just increments the index, so we'll look at the next one. Now the reason why we want to use a flag rather than a uh, continue. Or, or a break is because later on we can use that flag to say, did we find it? If we did not find it, then we can provide a message and say it's not there. And note that this is using a do another loop. Ask you if you want to do another. 
And so it'll keep, so we have this is, we have all these loops inside of this entire loop. So let's run this. I'm going to run it first without debugging. Just to see how it runs overall. And so I'm going to put Kelly in. And it found it. And in this case, I put a name that wasn't in there. You notice that it, it says it didn't find it. So let's see. Let's run it in debug mode. And uh, I'm going to put my debug stop right here and start debugging. And we can start off with, did not find it. I'm going to hit F10. So I'm going to hit step over. And we're now in this next line. Did not find it is true. And let's go into the loop. So I can put another breakpoint and I'm going to continue on to that breakpoint. It's going to ask me for a name, so I'm going to put Kelly. That's the statement that was executed. I'm going to step over one. We're now in the while statement and the while expression it's going to evaluate to true. You can highlight the overall sections of the expression and if you hover over it, it'll tell you which, what each element evaluates to. So I'm going to hit step over and it's going to check to see if username at index, so names if we look at names, those are all the names that were, were were created in the vector. If I step over one, we can see that username was Kelly, names at index six. Index six. Or let's see, right now we're at index zero, so we're looking at names at index zero is Barbara. Well, Kelly does not equal Barbara, so it ignored this part, went into the else, and it's incrementing index. So if so it's going through step by step through these these names. Barbara, Kelly, Claire, Janice, Sierra, and Lucy. That's what was pushed back here. And since this username does not match that first one when it's when this start off with index zero, the first time it goes through this, it says I can't find it, and it says okay, let's increment the index. So we'll step over one more. We can see the index is now incremented to one. We'll step over one more. We're now up here. Index is now one because it was incremented. We're looking at the size. The size is six, so is one less than six? Yes, so this part of this is going to be true. Then we're going to look at did not find it. Did not find it is still true because it was initialized you know, at the beginning It's true and nothing's changed it so far, so yeah. And because of that, the entire expression here returns true. So since this entire expression is true, 
we're going to continue on. Step over. We're now in this statement. We're looking to see is Kelly equal to names at index one. So if we look at our list of names, the one the index one value is Kelly. So at this point, this should return true. And so we'll step over one step. And sure enough, that this whole expression here does return true. And we'll see now that it'll output names at index one. And we can see it output Kelly. By using the at method, what happens is it, it looks up since our index is one, it looks up the uh, ve the index at one. That's that gets us Kelly. That's why I'll put that here. And then index since index is one, it looks at origins, and the origins at one is Celtic meaning warrior or defender. So that ends up here. We're going to step over one more. We'll get that output. And then to see if it did not find it, we're going to now assign did not find it to false. And we'll see why that's done in a second. So we set that to false. It's going to skip over the else because this part ended up being true. So it did this instead of the else. Now did not find it is false. So false does not equal true. This whole part of the expression will be false. Even though this part of the expression is true, because of this and, true and false should return false. And it does. We can see that it returns false. Which means that it's going to not do any more looping. And so if we hit step over one more time, we can see at point of fact it, it went to the next statement after the loop and starts executing there. Since did not find it is false, it's not going to say the username isn't in our vector. And as a result, it'll skip that statement. It, unlike the time when we put a name that wasn't in there and it did execute that. And then we're back to here, do you want to do another? And it allows us to loop back through and try again. Let's look at program 319. You may get that upgrade screen because some of these programs were done quite a while ago. If you do, just click OK and uh, it'll open up It'll convert it with whatever version of Visual Studio you have. You might get a migration report. You can just close that out. So we use the time function with our random number generator, but uh, we can also use uh, uh, well, in this case, let's see, we're using a program uh, to convert time. So this program converts time between hours, minutes, and seconds, and seconds. And so this is a pretty simple program. And it's using a switch statement. And here the user gets a little menu. It says, you know, do you want to convert hours, minutes, and seconds? Do you want to convert seconds to our or do you want to convert hours, minutes, and seconds to seconds? Or do you want to convert it the other way? And then, or do you want to exit? We get the choice. And so the switch statement is often used for menus. And in this case, if they pick one, then um, it asks the user for hours, minutes, and seconds. And then basically just multiplies uh, everything out in order to get the number of seconds. And then if they enter two, what this one does is ask the user for the number of seconds and then does some division to get the hours, minutes, and seconds. Notice that we're doing integer division. 
um, and that we're putting the number, by doing integer division, it throws away the remainder, so that makes this section work. And then finally, you, you, the exit just breaks and uses a, break, or uses a break statement to break out. And uh, so we have a, in order to keep this looping, we put this whole switch statement is placed inside of a do another, or a do while, and the do while checks to see if the person has not entered three here, when they see in their choice, if they don't put in three, it assumes that you need to do another. So if I run this one, you know, if I want to convert hours, minutes, and seconds, I could put uh, five, 45, and uh, maybe 12 seconds. And it gives us the total number of seconds. If I want to convert to seconds, two hours, minutes, and seconds, I can put a number in. It'll do that. You can see this menu allows you to do go either direction. If I hit three for exit, it exits the program. And so, a nice little program that demonstrates how to use a switch statement, and also shows that you know these our programs are going to be. Statements nested into statements that are nested into other statements. So this is a switch nested into a do while. And then let's look at 320. So this is a function that's going to look for uh, vowels inside of um, a statement. So here we are including the CC type library in order to get two lower is punk and is space uh, functions. And so welcome to the vowel counter program. And it starts off with setting the answer to yes. And that's because we have a while loop that's going to keep repeating. And this is a, you know, normally actually a do while makes more sense for do another loop. But in this case, they kind of structured it uh, using a while loop. And that's okay too. Um, you ask if they want to do another. And if the answer is yes, it'll keep going through. So you can structure your do another loops with a do while or a while statement. And then it has a variable for sentence, a character for letter, some integers to count elements up. And so we start off by checking the while. Since the answer automatically starts off as yes, it's going to do at least one iteration. Here they're initializing all the variables. And you can, you can chain your initializations this way, especially if you want them to start off as zero. It makes a lot of sense. Remember, assignment is uh, right to left associative. So this will be executed first. Then U count becomes zero. That gets set, zero gets sent to O count, which gets sent to I count, to E count, and A count, and all these will be initialized to zero. And they also initialize these two counting variables. So these are just a series of counting variables. And then we get a sentence from the user. And then what we're doing is we're iterating through the sentence. So a a string is a sequence that uh, just like our vector has a size method and that size method will return the number of characters in this string sentence so sentence is a string and we're just going to use that to iterate through every character in the sentence we can then look at each letter by using the at function so the at function works with the vector but it also works with uh, a string and we can get the character at that position in the sentence. And so by going from zero to the total number of elements in the sentence, this is going to look at each character in that string called sentence. Well then we can lower we'll then create a lowercase version of the letter uh, so that we're always looking at the same things. And then remember 
the switch statement works not only with integers, but also with char, with char. And chars are really just a number. So when we make a letter here, uh, we're just getting the letters of char. And so we can use a switch statement with that. And A, E, I, O, U are our vowels. And so every time, if, it, if it's one of those, then it'll increment A count, E count, I count, O count, U count. And then, and so we can use that switch statement to find which one of these they are and, and update the appropriate counter. The next thing we do is look, we can call this function is punk from the C, C type library and see if it's a if the letter is punctuation. If it is, if, if is punk does not equal zero, so it returns a non-zero. So is punk will return something other than zero if it is punctuation. And then we can increment the punctuation counter if it is. If it's a space, we can we'll increment the space counter. And then we display the results and ask if the user wants to do another. So let's run this and see how that works. And we can say yes. It counted up the number of A, E, I, O, U's. So there's an E, an O, two O's. They're there. And the punctuation marks, there's the punctuation mark, and the spaces, there's one space. And so this is an example of using a case statement, using a for statement, and then using this library, the CC type library, to get access to uh, information about you know each individual character for, for using two lower is punct and is space. And let's look at program um, 321. So this is C++'s pawn pump calculating program. And uh, so I think this is dealing with uh, pawns and pumps to, to that uh, are used to circulate the water in the pond. And so, you know, the pumps come into the, so we have, we want to create a data structure to hold the, the different size pumps are. And you can see, we declare our vector, a vector of integers called pumps. And then we're using the pushback function to put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight values onto that vector. So that vector is now holding these eight values. And then uh, we declare three integers for width, depth, and length. And we ask the user to input the length, width, length, width, width, and depth of their pond. Notice the C and dot ignore because we're going. To, obviously, they're going to, it's going to be some get lines later on. So if there's a get line that's coming up after C N, never forget to put the C and dot ignore. We'll then get the. Uh, Calculate the volume of the pond by multiplying length times width times depth. And to get the gallons, we need to convert the cubic inches that we get from that calculation with it by a conversion factor in order to get gallons. Notice that uh, the author of this program was smart in putting in the the uh, units of this of this variable inside of the variable name so that we know what we're dealing with. And this is a great technique to ensure that you don't miss your type conversions or your, your numeric conversions. They report that out to the user and then ask, and then 
the pump, we want to make sure that we have twice the capacity of the gallons, so we do that operation. And the number of pumps is equal to the pumps vector times size. You could actually hard code that, but what if we wanted to change that? We want to add another pump on here. We, can, we could do that, and then this code ensures that we don't have to go and update a magic number inside of the code. So it's a good idea often to use the size uh, property so that if you change your vector later, it, it, your code reacts automatically to that. And then we have the needed pump index. And often, if your variable name has an index, it's going to be a, a uh, it's going to be an integer that's meant to be used as a as a reference to which element inside of a vector you're going to look at. And then we have a boolean for is the fit true. So now we check to see if uh, twice the comp capacity, which is what we're looking for, is less than the pumps at zero. So they're doing kind of um, a check to see if it's smaller than the least, the lowest one. And the reason is, is because um, our logic for the for a loop that's coming up will work well to check ranges between the pumps sizes, but at the bottom and the top end, we need to check those first. And if uh, it's if if the capacity we need is less than the smallest one, then we're just going to go ahead and use the smallest pump we have. If the capacity is larger than the largest one we have, then we'll just say, um, you know, use the largest one. Well, actually, what we're going to say is it's not a good fit, that we don't have one that's a good fit. So if it's not too small or too large of a pond, then we can go through our loop and iterate through each of the pumps. So that's what this is doing. We've got a number of pumps. And I'm not sure why they're doing minus one. Um, but they're iterating through each of the pumps and then seeing if the capacity that's needed is greater than the one you're currently... Oh, it's because they're doing it this way. If your capacity is greater than uh, the one below it and less than the capacity than the one above it, then you, that's the one you need. So basically they're comp going between each of the pairs of pumps and then comparing. That's why you have this minus one here because of the plus plus one here, when you check the one above it, that will automatically get the last pump. And then if, if, if you have, if you find that the pump you're, the range you're looking at, the pump, is be, the the capacity is between those two pumps what will happen is okay then the pump we need is not the lower one the at i1 it's the at i plus one so the needed pump index will be i plus one and then you can break so after it does all that this whole section is really kind of one section this if else if it else it's all dealing with find which pump it is it then checks uh good fit. So if it wasn't a good fit, then um, it'll say, you know, we have, this is the best one we could find for it, but it may be too large or too small, essentially. If it is a good fit, it says your pump needs, and it, it reports back the pump needed. And then we have our do another, which asks you another, and then it will run again. So let's give this a try. And let's see, let's go 100, 10, 25, and it gives us an answer. If it's a small one, then it gives us an answer, but it says, hey, you could probably use that one, but there might be a better pump for you. So this is an example of, you know, 
using ifs and else ifs and a bunch of logic to to dig through um, a vector that we created and uh, and and look for information. So that's what we reviewed. Um, thank you very much.